Hey everyone, it's me, John Lord, and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. Um, one of the cool things about doing this work for me is when people reach out to me and they are extremely passionate about a particular case. Um, and that is certainly what has happened on today's episode. So uh, before we jump into the episode, let me share just a little bit of what uh, the person I'm considering the researcher for this episode, Chris, had sent me. I never knew Cherry Mahan, even though I grew up not far from her. She was only about half a year younger than me and she never left my heart. I can remember very clearly hearing about her abduction and sitting in my own front yard, watching the road for any sign of that van. I never saw anything. I have never met the family, but my heart just breaks for them. Chris. Uh, Chris just really put the words together so well. I just wanted to share that with all of you. And that's a big reason why I do this show and why I believe many of you out there um, watch it. I think there's something about these stories that touches each and every one of us. And because Chris was so moved by this case, um, we're gonna go over it today and present some of the research that she worked so hard to put together, as well as some additional research I've done on top of that and share this story with all of you and maybe once again raise awareness to what was previously a very famous case uh, when it occurred, but it has since kind of died down. And the truth of this case for me is uh, someone out there knows something about what happened to Cherry. And we need to try to find that person and motivate them to do the right thing and to share that information with the authorities. I'm hoping that this video might do that. So with that said, let's jump into the case of Cherry Mahan. Here we have a poster from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that uh, includes a photo of Cherry Mahan when she, around the time that she went abducted back in February 1985. And then they've also included an age progression photo that you can see on the right. Uh, she is missing from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Date of birth, August 14th, 1976. Um, this poster was made a couple of years ago. I believe she would now be 40 years old. Uh, she's a female, white, brown hair, hazel eyes. She was four foot two and weighed only 68 pounds when she went missing. Uh, they've done the age progression to 38 years. She was last seen getting off the school bus about 100 yards from her home. A bright blue 1976 Dodge van with a mural of a mountain and a skier may be involved in her disappearance. Cherry has pierced ears. She was last seen wearing a gray coat, blue denim skirt, blue leg warmers, and beige boots. Already in this very short description of the story, we hear how tragic this is. A girl just coming home from school, being dropped off by her school bus that was literally just around a bend from where her house was. I've heard different estimates on it being 100 yards to 150 yards from her actual house to the bus stop. But, um, you know, I think back to when I was a kid and how many times did I walk from bus stops that were much farther than a couple hundred yards away from it, from my home. Um, so certainly tragic circumstances. Let's jump into the information that Chris has pulled together and learn more about this story. Cherry's mother's name is Janice McKinney. She got remarried after Cherry was born and they lived in Cabot, Pennsylvania. That is located about 20 miles north of Pittsburgh. It's rural, a lot of farms and large open and wooded areas. At the age of eight years old, Cherry Ann Mahan went to her elementary school on the morning of February 22, 1985, rode the school bus home, got off the bus around 4.05 p.m. with three other students, approximately 100 to 150 yards to her home on Corn Planter Road. Her parents heard the bus pull up. When Cherry did not arrive at the home a few minutes later, her stepfather went out looking for her. He did not find her and called the police. Police came to the home and began talking to the family, neighbors, and children on the bus. Several of the children from the bus reported seeing a very distinct looking van. It was a 1976 bright blue or green Dodge van with a snowy mountain scene with a skier in a red and yellow ski suit skiing down the mountain painted on both sides of the van that had been following the school bus. And we're gonna jump back over to the NAMIS profile on this. Here is a drawing of what that van supposedly looked like. So you can see it's an extremely large mural that is on the side of the van. 
the rest of it would have painted, been painted either blue or green. Since there was a lot of attention on finding the van owner, it was very underreported that there was also a small blue car behind the bus as well. Neither vehicle nor their drivers have ever been identified or located, and it has never been determined if either vehicle was even involved in the disappearance of Cherry. Cherry Mahan was the first person ever featured on the Advo cards, which featured her in May of 1985. Uh, if you're not familiar with what those cards are, if you sometimes will get in the mail, have you seen me? Have you seen this missing person? Um, this is the earliest version of those cards. Those cards have helped solve many cases, but unfortunately have not brought anything substantial to Cherry's case. In 1998, Cherry's family had her declared dead in Butler County Court, and the life insurance money was donated to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. A settlement that was received by Cherry for a car accident was put into a trust for her brother Robert that she never knew as he was born four years after she went missing. No trace of Cherry or any of her clothing or backpack has ever been found. Someone had reported at some point that they believed they saw the van on the Pennsylvania Turnpike in 1987. That lead was impossible to follow up on per the statement of the trooper that is now leading her investigation. In 2011, uh, 26 years after her disappearance, there was a woman who was adopted in Michigan and she was tested for DNA to see if she was Cherry. She was not and the woman has never been named. They've been keeping her name private. Uh, 2015, a memorial was held in Cherry's honor, hoping that with 30 years passing, someone would be willing to bring forth any information. And Cherry's mother now lives in Saxonburg and is still looking for answers. There is only a little coverage of this case generally on each of the milestone anniversaries for her disappearance and when the previous detective retires and hands off the case to a new detective. Her case is still open and active and nothing has been generated in terms of substantial leads in all this time. So outside of the picture of the van, um, we do have a couple of other age progressions that they've done as the years have gone on here. And this one is the most recent. Uh, it looks like they did it in February of 2015 on the 30th anniversary. There is a Wikipedia page on this, but unfortunately it has about as much text as the missing poster does. It doesn't really go into the case very in depth at all. CNN covered this in 2011 and they got some comments from her mother at that point. And I wanted to share those with you. Uh, quote, I should have been there when Cherry got off the school bus and I wasn't, Janice McKinney told CNN. Four o'clock, the bus came and we heard it and she just never came up the driveway. There was snow on the ground the day Cherry vanished, but no footprints leading to her house, suggesting to investigators that she didn't get far and was picked up quickly. After Cherry's disappearance, her mother didn't want to go through life without a child. Five years later, she had a son named Robert. Cherry's mother just wants to know what happened to her little girl. At the family cemetery plot, there is a statue of an angel for Cherry, not a gravestone, because her mother can't bring herself to place one there until she knows the truth. Quote, I have resigned myself to the fact that Cherry is okay, whether she is dead or alive. If she's dead, my family is taking care of her. If she's alive, someone else is taking care of her. All I pray for now is to know one way or the other. I imagine it would be extremely tough to deal with this. Um, and I've seen things reported two ways. I've seen uh, some articles saying that her stepfather would go and pick her up um, from the bus stop. But I've also seen reports that her mother was regularly out there. Either way, it seems like typically one of her parents was out there to pick her up. And unfortunately, on this day, that wasn't the case. And I, I would just be pretty racked with guilt myself if I was in their shoes. So I totally understand that. And you're now talking about 32 years after the fact. That is a heavy burden to carry for that long. So I'm very hopeful that someone out there has the answers that this family needs so that they could finally put all of this to rest. Um, outside of this, when, the, when CNN was covering this, um, they also got an interview with an investigator that was working on the case. I wanted to share uh, a clip with you from him. I believe Cherry was abducted by somebody she knows very well. And uh, I believe that uh, 
This person had the ability to, to basically lure Cherry to their vehicle without her giving it a second thought prior to her disappearance. Seems like a very strong conviction, and basically that's based off a tip that came to their office. Um, they felt very strongly about this tip. There are several articles written about this potential break in the case in 2011, but unfortunately no details were released to the public, just that there was this tip. We don't know what the tip was, um, and this is as much information as I could find on it that it seems to allude to the fact that this was someone that Cherry knew. Um, but I don't know if that tip, I would assume that it actually didn't pan out because here we are six years later and the case is still not solved. Um, he gets pretty emotional uh, in the rest of this video clip. I'll save it in the uh, description box for you below so you can check it out. It's very obvious to me that there are a lot of people that are touched by this story even 32 years after the fact, um, including a few investigators that are working on this and I'm hopeful that that will help motivate them to continue working on this case. It, obviously it has been, because this case has effectively, from what I can see, has been open this whole time for 32 years. So um, the answers are out there somewhere. I, I just hope either someone finds those answers or the person with them comes forward. Heading over to triblive.com, I did find an article from 2014 that makes it very clear that the investigation is continuing. Uh, it talks specifically about a group of volunteers and search dogs that combed a site off Winfield Road um, in July of 2014. And they also note down here that despite the age of this case, new information is still coming in. According to this article, they get at least a tip a month but sometimes that ramps up to even a tip per week on this case, and it just is constantly going on. All those tips are being looked into. This article also notes, during the past 29 years, troopers have written more than 4,900 pages of reports about the Mahan case that doesn't include dozens of photos and related information. So it seems to me, uh, at least by what I'm seeing in the media here, people are working very hard to try to figure out what happened to Cherry. And here at the postgazette.com, uh, we see another note, Cherry Mahan case still open 30 years after she disappeared. I didn't know this about the age progressions done by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, so I wanted to be sure to share this with you. Four staff artists at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children recreate such images every two years until a child is 21, and then every five years, says Robert Lowry Jr., Vice President for the Center's Missing Children Division. I think that's pretty awesome. Um, I think that is certainly a helpful tool to have a photo out there that would be close to resembling what the person should look like at that particular age. Um, that's why this is one of the organizations that I support regularly with donations. But just wanted to share that with all of you. And another note about their amazing work here. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children won't close Cherry's case until she's physically found. The state trooper that's uh, leading the investigation said the case will remain open as long as Cherry could be recovered or a suspect could be prosecuted, possibly through 2085. I think that would be pretty unbelievable. I've never heard of them um, considering working on a case for that length of time. As a matter of fact, it seems like some of the cases that they try to bring to trial after 40, 30, 40 years uh, have trouble um, with their convictions. So. I think this, more than anything, just goes to show the passion of the people that are working this case uh, and how strongly they want this thing solved. So that's it for most of the coverage on this case that's current. Um, what about some theories? What's, what's going on here? Well, Chris put together a few um, theories that she was bumping into regularly while reviewing this case. Some people think the parents, or one of the parents, mostly the stepfather, had something to do with her being missing. Now, I've seen some notes that the stepfather might not be alive anymore, but I couldn't really confirm that information, so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, if he's not, we didn't get any kind of deathbed confession. Um, if he is still alive out there, I don't know that it's ever been investigated in that direction. The, um, at least from the way the story's told as we've reviewed it today and as I've seen it in the media, it seems like the stepfather and the mother were at home at the same time, like they both heard the bus pull up. So if they were home at the same time, I think they could kind of account for where each other was, and I don't know that that necessarily means that he had harmed her in any way. I think, you know, 
as a typical course of investigation, I would hope that they looked in that direction very early on in this case. Um, I would assume that they did and they probably ruled him out. I don't know that there's a whole lot to this and I certainly didn't bump into any information to allude to uh, him being involved in this in any way. The second theory that has been floated around is that the van had either stickers of the scene or temporary paint so it could be easily removed and the van would be a plain van uh, so it would no longer be noticeable. Um, I think something more likely but kind of along that same line would be that if the person had the van, even if it was a mural that was actually painted on the side of it, they would probably have repainted the van when they saw all the news coverage and that that van was being specifically looked for. Um, now that we're talking about this 32 years after the fact, I don't know that the van is going to be the key piece of evidence to crack this thing open. I think too much time has passed. That thing could have been painted 10 times between then and now. Um, so I'm not sure that that van will be identified unless they find a suspect and that suspect happens to have a van. I mean, it could happen through, through that mechanism, but I don't think the van is going to be the linchpin to cracking this case open. The, of course, that's just my opinion. Uh, another theory is that the car was the one that took her and the van was there to distract the people. Once again, certainly a possibility. I'm not sure how feasible it is. It just increases how many people know about this. Um, and once again, we don't have anyone that's come forward with this information. Uh, why would the van necessarily be all that distracting just because it had this mural painted on the side of it? Is that really going to be enough to try to grab the focal attention of everyone on the bus while the blue car makes off with a little girl? I don't know. I don't know. It, it feels a little bit too much like um, something that'd be written for a TV show or something like that. I don't know that it's that practical if you were really going to execute things in that way. And, of course, we also have the uh, information that came in in 2011 about the new tip, but it doesn't seem like that panned out. However, I did see uh, Cherry's mom comment on that thought that could it be someone that she knew. And she did say that Cherry was extremely friendly. If it was someone that had spoken to her once or twice before, um, it, it certainly is possible that Cherry could have been coaxed into their vehicle. So... Um, Along those lines, once again, if they were just conducting normal investigation on this right from the start, uh, procedurally, uh, I believe that they would have looked into kind of known associates, known family members, friends of the family, um, at least questioned them at the time. Now, it's possible that they questioned a suspect uh, and they didn't notice uh, or double check the information to see that that person was lying or that their alibi wasn't solid or something along those lines. I do believe that that kind of stuff happens. Um, but I don't know, you know, considering that that tip came out in 2011 and it seems like it never panned out, it just, it doesn't seem like that information was very solid. Outside of all this, if you do a search for uh, Cherry Mahan on YouTube, you will see that there are a pair of sisters that are psychics and for some reason they are just making tons of videos about them supposedly assisting on this case. I've seen news coverage that is suggesting that when you talk to the authorities they are not saying that these sisters are helping in any way in any official capacity um, and you know this case still isn't solved so I, I, I got to be honest with you guys, it kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit to see that the majority of videos about this case were actually about these psychic sisters. I, I don't know that that is really uh, helpful. If I mean, if they have information to help the case, help the case. Solve this thing and sure, go, go do the, the talk show tour and uh, we'll all support you. But it seems like they're trying to grab attention for assisting in this case and I don't know that anything has really come out of that. Um, I do believe I saw some other comments from the mother. It seems like uh, she was talking to psychics at some point. I don't know if it's these same uh, sisters, but uh, in any regard, I'm just I'm not seeing anything helpful by the videos they're posting, and I'm kind of questioning why they're they're doing that in the first place. But here's where I turn it over to you. Um, please take a look into this case. We've got a bunch of links for you in the description box below. Uh, let me know if you have more theories. Um, obviously, I don't think that she ran away. Um, we've got other children that seem to have noticed uh, at least one strange, if not two strange vehicles around the bus stop at this time. Um, you're talking about such a narrow window 
um, for this girl being picked up as opposed to her just making the few minutes of walk time before she was home. Um, I almost have to wonder if that theory that it was someone that knew her, um, there might be something to that. Uh, it could, especially when you consider that the parents are normally out there, is there some reason why this person might have known that the parents weren't going to be out there that day? Um, or are the parents kind of remembering things a bit differently 30 years after the fact? Maybe they weren't out there to get her every day. I mean, she was eight years old at this point. I'm pretty sure I was walking all over town on my own at that point. Uh, and I wasn't living in exactly the safest neighborhood in Southern California. Uh, but once again, like I said, it was the mid-80s. It was just a different mentality for a lot of people. If you have other theories, please share them in the comments below. And if you find any other sources or links of information you think are important, please share them with the rest of us so we can check those out. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. Um, of course, contact information is below if you do have any information on this case. Uh, I've included the case number. We've got the link to NAMIS. Um, we've got all kinds of different ways that you can send in information if you have any on this case. And I'm just very strongly asking that if you are a person that has, even if it's something you're not sure of, but you've heard something somewhere, just forward that information in. Please, please, please. This is, this is a family that has been dealing with this with, for far, far too long. Thank you for watching this episode. I really appreciate each and every one of you out there. Please share it with your friends in the Pennsylvania area. Let's get some exposure raised back to this case. Take care, everyone, and I'll catch you on the next show on the Lord Nards channel.